here and enjoy myself. Here's the game's news. Tough life, you know. A new mod entitled The Wind is being developed for Half-Life. No, it's not about flatulence. In a change from the usual first-person shooting and entirely in black and white, it's a film noir detective game which sees you quizzing people in a seedy 1950s underworld. For more information, go to monstro.co.uk. E.T. is making a console comeback. A company called Z2 has been hired to develop the game for both PS2 and Game Boy Color. Expect it to arrive in 2002 to coincide with the re-release of the Spielberg classic. Game giants Konami have had their most successful financial year ever. Their net sales top the equivalent of £1 billion, and this is partly due to their acquisition of fitness club operator People Co Limited and their music and dance games. With sequels of Metal Gear Solid and Silent Hill on the way for PS2, this year things are looking even better. Sega arcade hit Space Harriers is on the way to Nintendo's GameCube. The game is said to be very early in development and is being ported to the machine by Amusement Vision. In case you're familiar with the title, it's a next-gen update of a Sega arcade classic. You play the part of flying human characters with tons of firepower and plenty of enemies to use it against. The game is essentially a 3D on-rails shoot-em-up that moves around at a breathtaking pace and looks stunning. However, there's the promise that the game will look even better than its arcade version due to the phenomenal power of Nintendo's GameCube console. Here's hoping. Sticking with game development news, there are a couple of big titles coming to PlayStation 2. First up, Eidos and Ironstorm have confirmed PC Smash Deus Ex is in development for Sony's console. The game is a cross between an action first-person shooter and role-playing game. Ironstorm are promising all the depth of the original game with a streamlined interface, specifically created for PS2. Our second big title is the sequel to Arcade Smash Capcom vs SNK, and it's entitled Capcom vs SNK 2. How original. The game should be hitting arcade soon, but a PS2 version will follow shortly after. As always, there is the promise of new characters and tons of cool moves. Hopefully, it'll also be a better conversion than the Dire Street Fighter X3 2. Lastly, Xbox launch details have been confirmed for the US. Microsoft will unleash the eagerly anticipated console on November the 8th. The machine will cost $299, with software coming in at around $49, and the controversial DVD remote can be snapped up for $30. A promised 15 to 20 titles will be ready at launch, and Microsoft also reckon there will be 800,000 machines available on launch day, so no PS2 type shortages are expected. Unfortunately, no European launch details were divulged, but you can rest assured that when they are, we'll be the first to tell you about them. The Game Boy Advance is out in the UK soon, and with it, we're going to see 3D games with the same sort of 3D as a Super Nintendo. Now, one of them's a karting game from Konami, and here's the info in TBA. Konami Crazy Racing is the first karting game on the Game Boy Advance. The game features eight initial characters, recognisable by their starring roles in other, more recognisable Konami titles, such as Castlevania and Metal Gear Solid. Game modes will include licensed tests, single races, tournament cups and multiplayer modes, with power-ups picked up around the courses, including bombs, homing missiles, triple missile volleys and force fields. The atmosphere is definitely that of a cartoony, tongue-in-cheek parody, as characters have oversized heads and appear more like children than the heroes and villains of their respective brands. It's a concept we're all familiar with. Race as fast as you can around the course and unleash as much firepower as you can at your fellow racers. The game is visually one of the best we've seen so far on the format and makes good use of the Mode 7 capabilities. Konami Crazy Racers is released alongside the Game Boy Advance on the 22nd of June. The sequel to Sega's arcade hit, turned Dreamcast Classic, is almost ready to hit the shops. The basic concept of Crazy Taxi 2 hasn't changed at all from the previous game. You play as an edgy taxi driver who drives around in a convertible taxi, collecting fares and driving like a madman. As the original game took place in a fictional city inspired by San Francisco, Crazy Taxi 2 takes place in a fictional city inspired by New York. The major new driving feature is the Crazy Hop move. 
The crazy hop launches your taxi into the air, lets you jump over cars, gaps and rooftops. The game also features a new multi-fair customer, which helps shake up the gameplay. Certain customers will be waiting in groups, or all want to go to different locations. When you pick up a group of customers, you're given one huge lump of time to deliver each customer to his or her destination. The game features four new drivers, each with their own taxi cabs. From what we've seen so far, Crazy Taxi 2 looks like more of the same frenzied action that made the first game so popular. Crazy Taxi hits stores in July. When it's a nice sunny day, like today, you don't want to be stuck indoors playing games getting a vitamin D deficiency, no, no, no. You want to be outside and here's a couple of add-ons that will let you do just that. Now first up, we've got this Pikachu pedometer here and basically what this does, it's more than just a Tamagotchi, you can clip it to your belt and when you walk around it counts the number of steps you take. You may think, well, what's so good about that? Well, these steps actually transform into watts for your little Pikachu, and then you can transfer these to your Game Boy via the infrared port and give yourself little presents. Now, you can't be bothered to walk around all day. You can even play a sort of little high-low game, a bit like play your cards right, or you can do what I do, and that's cheat and shake it up and down a lot. Now, if you're not into this newfangled Pokemon and like your games a little bit more retro, then you could do worse, so get yourself this little joypad. Now this thing, it doesn't plug into a PC, doesn't plug into a console, it actually plugs into the back of your telly via the SCART lead. And inside it, there's over 100 retro games which enable you to have a bit of retro fun. So if we just turn it on here, we've got it plugged into the TV, select one of the games, and there we go, we're two frogs at the moment trying to lick flies out of the sky. And as you can see, the graphics aren't too good. I've got the sound turned down because the sound is terrible, but we're assured it's gameplay that counts. Now, being a nice sunny day, like I said earlier, I'm gonna get back to the park. Yes, I know, we've already gone through what you can expect on Gran Turismo 3A spec, but guess what? The game's so complex, we couldn't fit it all in one episode. So here's more of what you can expect under the bonnet. Gran Turismo 3 may be a sequel, but there are plenty new additions to salivate gamers' appetites. We've been playing the game solidly, so here's a lowdown on all the cool new stuff. First up, there are a few new courses, our favourite being Côte d'Azur, which is basically the Monaco Grand Prix track. Next up, we have possibly the most difficult racetrack ever, the aptly named Complex String. Just look at all those crazy bends. There are a few new rally courses as well, but the most impressive being the new Swiss Alps Dirt Runway. Lastly, we have a track based in Japan. The new Tokyo track is a high-speed course, and if you look closely, you can even spot Sony Computer Entertainment's shiny headquarters as you're racing along. To go with all these new tracks are a whole host of new supermotors. Just take a gander at this lot. Another neat new trick is the ability to top up your car's oil. This is important, however, because neglecting this will affect your car's performance. And lastly, we've unlocked the super secret F1 mode for your viewing pleasure. This version of Gran Turismo features F1 cars, and they're just as exhilarating as the real thing, with blistering speeds and glue-like handling. Well, that's it for our GT3 lowdown. Now, what does our assassin think on the new PS2 title? Well, you'll have to tune in after the break for the definitive review. OK, review time. Now, the first game to go in the Assassin's ginger layer of scrutiny is Confidential Mission. It's a shoot-em-up, it was out in the arcades, and now Sega are bringing it out on the Dreamcast. Take a look. Confidential Mission. If you've played Virtua Cop, you've pretty much played Confidential Mission. It's just an on-rail shooter where you have to aim your light gun at people who pop up in front of you. Those who can shoot you will be circled with a big red ring. Those that can't, won't. Every enemy will take one shot to die. There'll be a couple of little shooting. At the end of the level, there'll be a boss who takes a few more shots to die. All good fun, but unfortunately, Confidential Mission is over very, very fast. Confidential Mission looks okay, 
but that's just about all you can say for it. The graphics are pretty clean, pretty solid, but most of the enemies look strangely misshapen. And if you compare this to the now ages old Virtua Cop series on Dreamcast, it doesn't really look that much better. And we'd have expected a little bit of improvement after all these years. The one good thing about Confidential Mission is that if you were one of the poor fools who plumped for the Dreamcast light gun early on, this will be the only chance to dust it off that you've had for the last couple of years. But even this chance doesn't last that long, and you're still going to be questioning why you ever bought the thing. Short on ideas, shoddy, and just plain short, Confidential Mission really was a big mistake. Sega should have just left this one in the arcades where it belonged. Well, all this hard work has actually made me quite tired, but stick with us for part two, because we review the import version of Gran Turismo 3, and we show you how to build your own PC. That's a personal computer, not police constable. Now, how do I get down? Chislak is in a hurry. Let's cut to the chase. He's got his hands on some of the fastest, most expensive and desirable vehicles around. <laughs> this boat is luxury in its purest form. Just listen to the sound of that engine. <laughs> oh, yes! It is outrageously fast. In short, it's the dog's crown jewels. Live the fantasy and drive the dream machines tonight at 7.30 on .tv. Sure. Alone in the dark, can you see beyond your fear? An Infograms game. No, I don't think I have a window for you today. I got a Feng Shui consultant coming. Oh, that's him now. Gotta go. Call me Zane. Let us begin. It's done. CD in a recording session, please, pal. Music for you means any free CD, exclusive merchandise, and once in a lifetime experiences. Simply collect tokens every day in the sun and news of the world. Mmm, oh, those are delicious. Delicious. Here, try a little bit of mine. You can tell it's fresh. Oh, yes, you can always tell fresh. Coppenrath and Visa cakes and desserts are made from only the freshest ingredients. Fresh. Yes. Koppenrath and Wiese is a highly acclaimed German bakery whose cakes can now be enjoyed anywhere because they come frozen. Oh, I never really liked it anyway. Koppenrath and Wiese, amazingly fresh, incredibly frozen. And Perry, uncovering Ibiza. Yeah, bud! No parental guidance necessary. Boy, well, I didn't think we were going to let you go on your own. That is so unfair! Ow. A hormonal holiday of a lifetime. Sorry, guys. No monsters. Harry Enfield and Kathy Burke. Kevin and Perry go large. One of 25 movies now showing on Sky Box Office. No concessions for senior citizens. Still to come on Game Over, our top five funny games and an import review of Gran Turismo 3.
But first, if you want a cheap PC, you want to make it yourself. So here's part one of our guide in the Game Over Boot Camp. Now, before you can start building your dream PC, you have to think about what parts you need and compile a checklist. You'll need a case. A mid or full tower is best, and it should have enough drive bays for any components you want to slot in. Most cases come with a built-in power supply, but if not, opt for one with at least 300 watts of power. We've chosen this Cooler Master case because it looks beautiful, and fitted a 350 watt Enamax power supply into it, which is more than enough juice for our needs. Now, the central processing unit, or CPU, is the heart of your machine, so you should buy the fastest one you can afford, and it's never been a better time to buy a processor, with prices being so cheap at the moment. We would recommend an Intel Pentium 3 flip chip, or an AMD Athlon Thunderbird, because they offer exceptional bang for your bucks. We've opted for a 1000 MHz AMD chip. It doesn't end there, though. You'll need to clip a cooler onto your chip, otherwise it will overheat, and most probably melt. In this case, we need an AMD Socket A type cooler, capable of cooling at 1000 MHz and beyond. We've opted for a Thermo Engine cooler. Once you've decided on your CPU and cooler, you need to decide on a compatible motherboard. Once again, AMD motherboards will support Socket A processors, and we've opted for an iWill board. It's one of the fastest Socket A boards on the market, but this is reflected in its quite steep price too. Now we'll have to start thinking about slotting in some random access memory, or RAM. Our iWill board can handle SD RAM at speeds of 133 MHz or above, but at Game Over we're speed freaks, so once again we've opted for the fastest gear available in the form of some Corsair RAM. Right, that's it for part one. On our next boot camp we'll be looking at the remaining components, but before we go, here are some useful places to source the gear you need. Now, a lot of our components are quite specialist in nature and not the sort of thing you'll find in your local PC store. Try specialist online retailers like overclockers.co.uk to find this type of gear. However, if you want to save money, you can opt for less high-end components. Try your local PC superstores or an online retailer like dabs.com. Lastly, it's also worth checking out computer fairs, which take place weekly all over the place. Log on to computerfairs.com to find your nearest one and good luck with your shopping. Games have come on leaps and bounds since the old 8-bit format about 15 years ago. And if you're wondering what games the people that make games now made then, then here's an insight. This is Gary Carr. He's one of the most talented and experienced artists and has worked in the industry for 14 years. He's joining us today to talk about Startopia, a new strategy game from developers Mucky Foot. In this game, you take control of a space station as you aim to reunite different space races. However, we have another question. What was his first game? But the first game I had a, a, a major role in, involved with was a game called Barbarian, which was a, a big game in the mid-80s. Today, games cost millions to make, but in those days, the game was made for 10,000 quid, but it still proved to be controversial. It did a couple of things for the first time. It, it decapitated an opponent and blood spurted out of the neck and uh, it also had a page three um, girly on the cover which I have to say my, my boss Steve Brown at the time he used his, um, his position in the company to basically meet his his favorite page three model so he, he contrived the situation to actually have her on the cover of the game there was no real gameplay uh, reason for doing that other than he wanted to exploit the situation <laughs> and yes that is Wolf from Gladiators by her side the animation was quite advanced for the time, so how did they do it? We basically copied the moves out of films like Red Sonja and uh, Conan the Barbarian, so we, we actually practiced these moves for weeks. The thing was there was only one sword that was any good, and it was very convincing, but we only had one, so I had to have a plastic sword because I was the junior member of the team at the time. So I'm fighting with a little plastic sword from Woolies, while um, Steve had the very impressive wooden um, broadsword. Sounds like it was all quite a laugh. You know, the old days were great, but uh, you were very limited to what the machines could do. And, and as an artist, for example, I mean, there's only so much creativity when you're pushing two colours, uh, you know, and big blocky pixels around the screen. So it's nice now to have absolutely no limitations. But there is a, a skill in creating something that people can look back on and say, that was a great game, when really all you're doing is showing big blocks of colour. And so now he's making games like Startopia. How things have changed.
Now time for five games that made us giggle in the collection. It's a bit of a harmless fun at number five with Banjo-Tooie on the N64. It's Banjo's second adventure on the format. He's up to his old tricks once again. The game puts you up against some ridiculous enemies, allows you to take part in some hilarious sub-games, and to top it off, the split-screen multiplayer shoot-em-up game is about as stupid as gaming gets. Putting up a good fight at number four, it's ready to rumble boxing round two on the Dreamcast. As well as the brilliant selection of fictional fighters, you can stick Bill Clinton against Michael Jackson, or unleash Hillary Clinton against Shaq O'Neal. With multiple taunts and special attacks, it's a guaranteed chuckle and great fun to play. At number three, it's Grim Fandango on the PC. You play as Manny Calavera, a travel agent for the Department of Death in the Eighth Underworld. Your job is to pick people up from the land of the living and sell them travel packages to the land of eternal rest. This game's got a constant flow of dark humour and a host of comic characters to keep you amused. Sporting a nasty headache at number two conquers having a bad fur day on the N64. You wake up with a nasty hangover, and from then on, things all start to get a bit out of hand. With characters such as intoxicated scarecrows and mice with a nasty case of wind, you'll always have a smile on your face in Rare's cheekiest title to date. And it's an old favourite that grabs the number one spot this week. Monkey Island 2 was probably the best loved game from the series, and a barrel of laughs. Even though the later versions were graphically superior, they couldn't quite match the comedy of LeChuck's Revenge. With pirates spitting competitions and second-hand coffin shops, it's a worthy winner. And for more gaming gossip and delight as usual, don't forget to log on to tvchannel.co.uk slash gameover. Now in part one, we took a further look under the bonnet of Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec, but what's it like to play? Well, here's the assassin with review number two. It's finally here, Gran Turismo 3 A-Spec, probably the most highly anticipated racing game of all time. And the good news is, it's everything you'd expect. It looks absolutely stunning, the cars in particular, unbelievably solid. But underneath all that, it really is still the same old Gran Turismo. Veterans of the Gran Turismo games on PlayStation will find themselves instantly at home here. The Gran Turismo mode and arcade mode have survived the transition to PlayStation 2. Ditto of most of the features of the games, the way you earn money, the way you go for progressively harder races, even the car wash. It's all here. Not that much change, and even the handling doesn't feel an enormous amount different. The gameplay may be familiar, but the graphics certainly aren't. This really is the moment when PlayStation 2 has spread its wings. Gran Turismo 3 looks unbelievable. The car models are stunning. Solid, detailed, right down to the last decal on the bodywork. Everything is there. They move superbly fast, supremely smoothly, and the tracks look organic. Finally, the illusion's there. You don't get the idea that this is made of polygons, and it's even better when you look off into the distance. There's no pop-up, there's no draw distance. This is a whole world they've created here, and it's beautiful. The handling may be pretty much unchanged, but that's not to say that Gran Turismo's designers have been totally resting on their laurels. There's a couple of cosmetic changes to the game, like how you now have to change your oil, otherwise your car will get gummed up after a few thousand miles. And there's a couple of much less cosmetic changes, like the improvements to the split-screen mode. If you're playing it in widescreen and you play it split-screen, you get two proper widescreen views of the action, which is brilliant. Even better, though, is if you play it split-screen and you happen to be lucky enough to have three PlayStation 2s, three iLinks, and three televisions, in which case you can get a six-player split-screen race, which you don't need us to tell you. It's absolutely brilliant. Even better than that, though, is that while the stables of cars have expanded all across the board, there's now some absolutely superb additions, like F1 cars, which has to be every Gran Turismo head's dream. Gran Turismo 3 is simply the best-looking racing game ever released. And the fact that it's still pretty much Gran Turismo, and you can still batter your cars off the walls without damaging them at all, it doesn't matter. Just look at it and you're hooked.
Now, before we go, there's an article in PC format this month about games programs on telly. And in the verdict at the bottom, they basically say that they're not as good as magazines. Well, luckily, they didn't include our show. Cool. What a lucky escape. Anyway, that's it. Time up. Mad Cattle, game over. Run titles.